Good afternoon and welcome uh, to our webinar, The Future of Truth and Reconciliation in Colombia, a conversation with Father Francisco de Rue. My name is Father Matthew Carnes, and I serve as the director of the Center for Latin American Studies here at Georgetown University. And we're delighted to serve as co-sponsor of this event with our colleagues at WOLA, the Washington Office on Latin America. For many years, we at Georgetown here have been deeply involved in the peace process in Colombia. My predecessor as director, Mark Chernick, lived and followed the peace process with a passion and a dedication that marked every breath of his life. And his impact continues to live out here at Georgetown and in Columbia. And so as we begin this event, we remember him today, and it's in his spirit that we're so grateful to be able to welcome his good friend, Father Deru. As I'm sure you all know, those of us who have joined us, the Colombian peace process constitutes one of the most important and audacious efforts to not only address decades of armed conflict, but also to reorient and reestablish the Colombian society on a new foundation of peace, security, dignity, and inclusion. It's a daunting and inspiring task, and many have questioned if it can even be done. That's why the work of La Comisión is so important. It's the body charged with clarifying the truth, with establishing a baseline understanding of the armed conflict and its violence, its human rights violations, its injustices, so that justice can be pursued. It's been a focal point in Colombia and around the world, and, it, and as it carries out its work, its mandate has recently been extended so that it might fully complete its task in the coming months. At this present moment, it's in a critical moment, and that's why we're so eager to convene, convene this conversation. And so let me introduce our two participants. First, we're delighted to welcome Father Francisco Jose de Rue Renifro of the Society of Jesus. He's a priest, a philosopher, an economist. He served as the provincial superior of the Jesuit order in Colombia. He's the founder of the Program of Development and Peace in Magdalena Medio, which was the first laboratory of peace in Colombia. He was also the director of CINEP, the Centro de Investigación y Educación Popular, Programa por la Paz. He currently serves as the president of the Comisión para el Esclarecimiento de la Verdad, la Convivencia y la No Repetición, the Commission for the Clarification of the Truth of Living Together and of No Repetition. This is the fundamental process that follows upon the Colombian peace process. He's known both nationally and internationally for his work toward the construction of peace, reconciliation, and the recognition of the dignity of the victims of the armed conflict in Colombia. Most notably, he served as mediator in various critical moments of the peace process, sitting at the table with former enemies as they sought out new paths of peace. He's written a number of books on the themes of public ethics, social conflict and development. And among his most important texts are Los Precios de la Paz, The Price of the Peace, and La Audacia de la Paz Imperfecta, The Audacity of an Imperfect Peace. Father Drew, it's a pleasure to have you with us. And Father Drew will be in conversation with Jimena Sanchez Harsoli, the director of the Andes office at the Washington office on Latin America. She's the leading Colombian human rights advocate at WOLA. She's an expert on peace and illegal armed groups, internally displaced persons, human rights and ethnic minority rights. Her work has shed light on the situation of Colombia's more than 7 million internally displaced persons, as well as helped expose the links between Colombia's government and drug funded paramilitaries. Originally from Argentina, her family was displaced during the country's civil war, fled to Europe, and subsequently moved to the United States. She holds a master's degree in international law and international economics from Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies and a BA from Columbia University's Barnard College. Jimena, let me turn it over to you to animate our conversation. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you so much, Father Carnes. Um, hello to everyone who has joined us this afternoon. We are really grateful to Georgetown University for inviting us to be part of this important and timely event with the director of the Truth Commission. Your university was the home of one of the most important US academic analysts and promoters of peace in Colombia. For a long time, Dr. Mark Chernick, a person who is very missed by many, but who is always in our hearts and whose legacy today allows for this important event uh, to take place. So on November 24th of this year, it will mark the fifth anniversary of the historic peace agreement between the Colombian government and the FARC. This agreement has been and continues to be 
the best instrument for addressing the longstanding structural issues of inequality, land, political participation, and justice that have generated cycles of violence, horror, and pain for many generations of Colombia and that has left over 7 million victims of its conflict. While no peace is attained easily and quickly, and this peace, like all others, has had its setbacks, since 2016, Colombia has undergone tremendous transformations with thousands of former fighters now demobilized, a new political party um, that was formed that uses the nonviolent democratic process to address differences. Um, wonderful things have taken place in Colombia. That said, um, this peace accord is not complete because there still remain other illegal groups present in the country, which help explain why um, we still hear news of some of uh, situations of concern, like a high level killing of social leaders and others. That said though, Colombia and the international community should take this fifth year anniversary to boldly recommit to prioritizing and fully implementing the 2016 Peace Accord, because doing so will actually help address these other issues involving the illegal armed groups and other challenges that the country still faces. This accord is very innovative in many ways, both in how it was negotiated and its content. It has an ethnic chapter that transversely addresses Afro-Colombian indigenous rights, a comprehensive integration of women and gender rights. It has a chapter on illicit um, crops and addressing uh, the drug trade, and it places the victims at the center of the accord. Another way that it's incredibly in innovative, and I would say um, very much a example for future accords is its transitional justice system that very sophisticatedly balances truth with justice, taking into account the latest standards from international law and our interconnected world. That transitional justice system includes a truth commission, a special jurisdiction for peace, and a unit to search for persons deemed to be disappeared. It's these three entities that work together in an integral manner to guarantee truth, justice, and non-repetition of human rights and international humanitarian law violations. The Truth Commission in Colombia is an extrajudicial entity. Um, it was established in 2017 for a period of three years plus six months, though its mandate was just extended seven more months to basically promote a common understanding in Colombian society of what happened during the decades long internal armed conflict and its differentiated impact on vulnerable populations. Its purpose is to promote and contribute to recognition of victims and to spur voluntary responsibilities by individuals and collectives in terms of what took place so that Colombian society can be educated so that um, such actions are not repeated in the future and the transformations can take hold to make uh, the Pacific resolution of conflict the way forward. The Truth Commission is also tasked with putting out a report that will aspire to contribute to structural transformations in the country. Among its many achievements so far, the Truth Commission has been very unique in its approach towards ethnic minorities and we were very happy to honor its ethnic commissioners earlier this year with the WOLA Human Rights Award precisely because they charted a new way of incorporating ethnic minorities in the Truth Commission process. So this crazy mandate of this Truth Commission is incredibly overly ambitious and almost impossible. How do you tell the story of a conflict that has so many sides where so much is at stake? What possible recommendations can be made to chart the course of non-repetition for current and future generations of such a complex multi-layered conflict? I cannot think of any other person um, for Colombia to pick to take on this challenge and to do it well, but Father Daru. Father Daru 
um, as was um, introduced by uh, Father Carnes, is perhaps the person most well positioned uh, to be able to take on this challenge. So we're very honored to have him here today to basically um, pick his brain about how he's been doing this and what can be done um, by us in the international community to um, support his work and this incredibly ambitious process. So the way that we're going to do this, I have a couple of questions for Father Derude. This is going to be a discussion format. And then we we'll also be taking questions from all of you. If you could please um, write them in the chat and we'll try to do as many as we can as possible. So to start off, Father Derude, what does it mean to search for truth in the internal armed conflict of Colombia today? What um, do you see as the main things that we need to know about this? And um, how is the country placed at this time to receive that truth? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jimena Sanchez for your introduction. And thank you also for the extraordinary work done by Bola in Colombia and the support we have received from you. And also thank you to Father Matthew Carnes for his presentation. I myself, am, I really appreciate enormously your invitation. Let me go to try and answer the questions with this sort of reflection, the truth. Certainly, do we have the information, the testimonies, memories, documents, studies, dialogues? And our task, as you said, is to clarify, to explain, and to discover the truth of the Colombian conflict. The truth we are looking for is just the truth of this internal situation. The truth of a humanitarian tragedy relevant to the victims, for those who are accepting responsibilities and for the society that tries for the war to stop from all sides of the confrontation. And in my opinion, there are four different aspects in the endeavor for truth. First, our personal commitment we are to face the reality of the internal armed conflict and we need total detachment with respect to political parties, friends, corporate interests, even relatives and families. No matter the difficulties, we are to stand for the truth. We require a continuous personal sincerity effort and we are submitting, as we are submitted to pressures expectations, criticisms, threats. It is a question of incorporating the truth in the personal flow of our lives. Secondly, we must be attentive to the narratives, the sufferings, and the feelings of the victims. The pain of the victims is basic. It's a basic reality that doesn't need explanations nor hermeneutics. The pain of the mother of a soldier killing the mountains is equal to the pains of the mother of a guerrilla killing the mountains. And we start accompanying the victims in their suffering. Without feeling compassion for the victims, it is impossible to understand. When Pope Francisco came to Colombia three years ago, He has spent a day alone with the victims. He stayed here for four years. And he has spent a day alone with the victims. And then meeting the bishops in Medellin, he told them, don't expect transforming this country just with your sermons. Go and put your hands in the bloody body of your people. In the third place, we have to clarify 
what and why. The effort to explain made the difference between the historical memory center and the truth commission in Colombia. The memory and the data are not the truth, but the place, the platform, we begin to wonder about the truth. I remember the day the paramilitary killed Alma Rosa Jaramillo in 22. She was a lawyer who joined our peace and development group in the middle Magdalena. We found the body of Alma Rosa on a river beach. They had cut off her arms and her legs with a chainsaw. Domingo, Alma Rosa's son was with us. He burst into tears and he started crying, tell me the truth. Who did this? Why? What purpose do they have? Who paid them? Were their political interests? Domingo was expressing the reality of his suffering and he was asking for the truth he wanted from the truth commission. What happened? Why? All with the same questions from the mothers of the false positives, the question of the women abuse, the question of the indigenous people. So we have to go through the process of analyzing, contrasting, listening to other questions, increasing the amount of insights accumulating in the search, and finally come to an evidence when we can affirm the truth that explains and answers the questions of the victims and the question of the society. But this is not a simple answer. It is the result of the systemic explanation. We are facing an entramado, a framework of several variables interacting, structural elements and personal decision acting together in each case. As you know, we have structural problems inequality, corruption, and cocaine problems, land ecological problems, gender and ethnic exclusions, political and security force problems. All of them are part of the systemic conformation of our internal, internal art problems or conflict. But the structural problem we had, the most difficult, the structural problem we had, the more difficulty to tackle with is us, we, ourselves. The way we have been hating, distracting ourselves and denying or resisting the pain of our people. The tragedy is the destructor of the dignity of all of us Colombians. How do we dare keep going in business and academy, in religion, liturgies and politics, when we have in our common house now million victims and a conflict that continues. This was the message from the victims, far Colombian and paramilitary victims when they came to La Habana. And this message changed the discussion and the decision in La Habana. People first, and we are part of our suffering people. In the fourth place, sorry, but talking again, <laughs> again about the truth. In the first place, we have two moral obligations at the presence of the truth. We must communicate. We have to tell the truth. We cannot stay silent. We must stop or reduce the number of lies circulated and challenged in public discourse. Even if public telling is dangerous and risky, and we have to commit ourselves in the, in the transforming of the structural, ethical, and political situation that is actually victimizing people. This is the moral obligation to produce non-repetition non recommendations. Finally, we are in the challenge of telling and receiving the truth in a way that instead of generating hate and violence and stigmatization, creates condition and possibilities for reconciliation and the construction of a common future 
from our political, ethnical, and cultural differences. And when I finish, I invite Alberto Ferguson to share with us his reflections about preparing ourselves and the society to facing this challenge. So this is about my answer, <laughs> Jimena, to your question. Well, a very beautiful answer with much dignity and humanity, very needed, not just in Colombia, but around the world. Can you tell us a bit more about how the process has unfolded so far? What are some of the obstacles that still remain as you go through this process? All right, but let me remember the, the big things, center of our mission, in order to answer your questions. More than 8 million displaced people, more than 7 million hectares stolen from the peasants, more than 22,000 massacres, massacres of 80 people, 120 people, 50 people, more than 25,000 kidnappings, more than 100,000 missing people, more than 6,000 false positives. I mean, young people from the poor neighborhood or small farmers kidnapped and assassinated by the military and publicly showed as terrorists killed in combat with the body count message as a sign of victory. More than 16,000 16, children involved in war by armed groups. Thousands of women violated, abused, tortured, and rivers and forests and mountains victimized in the conflict. It is now three years, as you said, we are listening to people in 28 houses of truce in the deep Colombian countryside, receiving Colombian exile in 24 countries. We got 23,000 personal testimonies, each one lasting several hours. We had 60 meetings with the army and the police. We have encountered the five former presidents of Colombia, more than 80 public encounters for the truth, recognition of responsibilities and reconciliations in villages hit by the violence like Caloto, Riachuelo, Caicedo, Argelia, Machuca, Apartador, Rivera, Sonson, and so on. Last week, the commission was in the Venezuela border, sailing the river Arauca and discussing with the communities along the river on issues of conflict resolution. Saturday, we were in Caucasia, Bajo Cauca, one of the places more victimized during the conflict. Yesterday, we received from 5,000 young people the initiatives about the future they want for the country. Every day, our communication office is producing videos, voice messages, and films. This is what we call the happening of the truth in Colombia, a continuous event that we perceive growing every day. But, You asked also about the present moment, Jimena. As you know, we got the peace agreement between the state and the FARC five years ago. You were, you were referring to that. But more than having a political polarization, there is today a profound fracture in the Colombian society, a social trauma. People are manipulated in the public sphere by leaders who mobilize the widespread hatred, panic, indignation, originated from years and years of victimization. And the manipulation produces emotional scenarios of rejection, distrust, exclusions, and uncertainty everywhere in the country. So with the situation where we are entering the political campaign for president and Congress. As you said, the Constitutional Court has prolonged 
the time of the commission till the end of June next year. And we will have two months to socialize and discuss the final report with the victims and the different groups of the society and the institutions. We focus ourselves today in the preparation of the best possible final report. And in many operations, we call the legacy or the legado, we are to deliver to the society and to thousands of allies, communities, organizations, universities, because the cause of the truth continues after the commission. Precisely about the question of the legacy, how do you think that um, people from the outside of Colombia, academics, um, experts and others can help preserve that legacy and also help that uh, be strengthened and pushed along in the future? Thank you for your question. For your question. Yes, we have been working in 24 different countries with Colombians in the, in the foreign countries. And they are, they, we call them the nucleus of the commission in the foreign countries. They have been just prepared in the legacy in these different places. We also are preparing, preparing a platform, in an internet platform you, you can contact by your phone, where all the basic information, but also the testimonies, the films, the final report, and the principal documents we join for the construction of our report will be at the hand of any person, anybody, any, anywhere in the world, trying to follow and understand what happened in Colombia. We hope they are going to continue the searching of truth in our country and discussing the, the transformation of a country like us in the future. Also, we are in contact uh, with about a hundred universities uh, everywhere, not only in Colombia, but in many places, just inviting them to join our effort in the same direction. Oh, it sounds like um, the ambitious task is even more ambitious than we all were aware of. <laughs> and it's They're become crazy. a globally, globally ambitious task, which yes. um, hopefully um, we can get a, a lot of people around the world to help with. Um, a crazy <laughs> <right. laughs> um, I wouldn't be uh, working at WOLA if I didn't ask this question. And then I would like to open up to some of the questions we've been receiving, which is, given the particular relationship that the US government has with Colombia, and given that uh, Colombia listens very much to the United States due to that partnership, what recommendations would you have in terms of the US government, how it can support this process uh, moving forward and help solidify all of those ambitious goals um, that you all are developing at the moment? You mean, this is a complex question. First, I have to say that the, the United States has support the Colombian peace process. And for us, the commission, they have been very supportive also. I have to, uh, yesterday we were, were with the, the young people from many places in Colombia presenting the result of the, uh, the way they were consulting the, the young people in the country the, the American, uh, how to say that? Uh, uh, okay. <clears throat> the embassy of the United States was supporting us. But um, we haven't yet got the sort of recommendation we are going to refer or we're going to place or we're going to ask from the United States. And basically my opinion, we need the support in the transformation of the security system in Colombia, referring to the army and the police, because 
they have had a great influence of the way the army behaved in Colombia within the country. And at the, at the same time, they have a group, enormous authority on our army. And if, if we want to make their transformation, we really need they to be, to be very effective. Uh, and I mean, and to take into, consider, to, into consideration the reason we had in our countries and uh, how to say that the, the dynamics producing the, 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 the the conflict in our country. This is to tell you, which in my opinion, is going to be the, the basic reference to, to the government of the United States. Well, we look forward to hearing those recommendations as they develop and seeing how a civil society and also academics and others can really support that, because we definitely agree with you on your analysis. So um, we've been getting a whole bunch of questions already. And what I think I will do is uh, maybe mention two or three at a time so that you can uh, respond as you wish. Um, the first question we got was, is it possible to change the destiny of Colombia with such a high level of inequality and poverty and with impunity so little penalized? in addition to a clear breach of orders and sentences in favor of the less favored community. So one question goes to the point of, um, given the huge challenges facing Colombia in terms of impunity and equality, is it possible to really transform its destiny right now? Another question that we got is about um, the protests of the indigenous communities recently and the violence that we've seen in terms of the armed groups in places like Cali, um, as well as a transformational period calling for increased police accountability, do the Colombian people still have faith in this greatly important peace process and all the work that you are doing at the Peace Commission to build a better society? Um, why don't we take those two and then we can go on to the next. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Okay, I, I will try to make some comments and also if it is possible to get, a, uh, to get an answer. And then I will invite Alberto Ferguson. Alberto, if you are following the discussion, because I think you could help us in the answer about subjects we have been discussing uh, in the commission. Uh, I have to say that I'm that I am an optimist about the possibility of changing the, the destiny of Colombia. Mm, and, and basically, there are two reasons that help me to be more positive. First, I have to say that everybody in Colombia, I mean, with a very, very, very few people really want peace in this country. And uh, the claim of the whole society, you get everywhere among the indigenous people, the Afro-Colombians, the trade unions, the universities, young people, please stop the war. And this is, this is, this is different. It, it wasn't the same 30 years ago or 40 years ago when there was some acceptance of, of having the guerrillas in Colombia. Today, this is not the case. And the second point is that after the strike, the general strike in Colombia four or five months ago, the business people in Colombia, and especially the big enterprises started thinking about the problem of inequality in this country. And in my opinion, for the first time, they really put themselves the question and the responsibility of changing the situation. If they want to have a future, even in their business. And um, about the situation in Cali, yeah, the, the commission was there present in the streets of Cali, having discussions and conversations with the indigenous people. And, um, and and try and inviting them to 
for trusting what we are doing. Um, I have to say that it's a hard situation, but indigenous communities are in the first place now with the Guardia Indígena and the Cimar Guardia Cimarrona uh, working for peace in the country. And Alberto, I invite you, Jimena, if you allow me, I invite, <laughs> allow, invite Alberto to, to. Yes, Alberto, welcome. Thank you very much, Father the Rule. Thank you, Jimena. Thank you, Matthew. I will be very brief. Um, probably one of the things I could mention very briefly is one of the big things we have learned in the during the past two or three years in the commission. And that's how we have to prepare ourselves and somehow accompany Colombian people to prepare themselves to, to receive the truth, to really be transformed by the truth. We are kind of convinced that unless it's not just the truth, truth as such, it, people have to be transformed by it. So we uh, learned that besides all the other things that we have to do, and I agree, Jimena, it's, uh, the, truth, the Colombian Truth Commission is a, an extremely ambitious project, but um, uh, we, we have to include how, how can we, uh, how can we communicate the truth to help people to transform themselves really. And that's how we have a, a kind of have a program in which beginning with ourselves, those of us who work in the Truth Commission, how we have to learn to look, look inside ourselves uh, before we see the truth outside and during the time when we're looking at the truth and after. You know, and because unless we have some inner transformation in our internal culture, internal way of behaving, we think it's going to really be difficult to uh, do meet our goal of the non-repetition, especially. So that's one of the big points. And I'll mention just two more. Um, we know perfectly well, and in the, the title of this event uh, that has to do with truth and reconciliation, we know, we all know that sometimes the two could be kind of incompatible sometimes. And there are very serious theories that show that they don't go together. And many people defend that truth commissions are to uh, are there to understand what happened and not to reconcile. And that's a, a serious position also. But what we've learned is that there is a bit of truth on that, but we also think that indirectly, kind of as a side effect, the only way to finally reach to reconciliation is to uh, grasp the truth, you know? And so we don't think that reconciliation has to be an explicit purpose, uh, but because if, if we gather the truth for a while, probably the thing will get worse. And we know that happens everywhere and there'll be a bit more of violence, but in the end, in the long run, only truth can really reconcile Colombian uh, people. Uh, and the la third and last point I would like to make is that uh, the unique place that, that the Truth Commission, and I would have to say, especially the leader of the Truth Commission, its president, uh, have a unique role in Colombia. The Truth Commission and his leader, they are probably the only uh, person and group in Colombia who really has a, a possibility to hold the country together. To, to contain the country, uh, to contain people, because Colombia is extremely polarized. And if you look at all the possible next presidents, which will have a new president next year, probably none of them will be able to really contain the country. And that's something which is one of the goals of the Truth Commission, to be able to do that. And, and the leadership of, uh, of Father Duru in that sense is really unique. And, and we and many people recognize that he has that goal uh, added to all the goals he may not, that we know that Truth Commission has. It's, it's another one. And it's very important because it's the only group and the only person that's really kind of holding people together, the only group that can talk to all the people in Colombia, to all the political sides, to the right, to the left, to the center, to every social strata, is the Truth Commission. And that's the, the, the position, that's the attitude that, and that's kind of uh, what we're, the, how we can help Colombia to kind of move somehow together and kind of process all the horrible pains that has been accumulated for years. That's what I would like to say, uh, Jimena, and thank you very much.
Uh, thank you, Alberto. Thank you. So I have, I'm trying to see if I can group these. There are a couple more like procedural questions that I'm going to ask, and then I'm going to go into some of the toughies that we've gotten here, <laughs> which is expected um, given that we are Georgetown. So the, the, the first question is very simple. How do you guys um, plan to socialize the document um, in the territories? Um, and then a second one is more about um, whether the commission is still open to receiving information and what is the time period or date range, date range that you cover? So let's start with those two. Well, we will have two months after June to socialize the result written or presented in the final report. And the 11 commissioners and also a group of people helping us, accompanying us, we are going to go around the country visiting the victims before and then the different communities, ethnical communities, women organizations, universities, also the Colombian government, the police and the army, uh, discussing with the far people who left the arms and also uh, obviously with the media trying and presenting the final report and discussing with, the, with them. I think it's the first time uh, Truce Commission is, is going to do that because usually the Truce Commission, they release their document and they weigh out from the discussion. Now we being commissioners and representing an institution of the state, we are going to discuss with the country uh, and also we are going to, certainly to increase the comprehension of what happened to us uh, during the country, during the conflict. Um, at the same time, we are preparing a lot of art products, uh, theater basically, and also films, and um, uh, documents, especially, especially films prepared in different languages for the indigenous people. And, uh, and try to sort of a, a kit of, how to say that? Um, okay. No, that, even in Spanish, I don't remember. I don't get it. Miguel, un español y lo traduzco. Sí, pero no se me viene. Ah, okay. Um, sort of like a toolkit. No, basically, it, it, educational uh, or um, uh -huh. uh, instruments, you know. Mm -hmm. for, okay, okay. This is, um, um, and for the second question, yes, we are open to receive new information to the month of to the month of the March, the Mars, the month. Oh, okay. Of March. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Yes. That's that's wonderful. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the fascinating things as an observer from the outside has been how, although you don't have your final report yet, you've already um, contributed to the truth with so many different hearings and so much different information and individualized material about so many different experiences of the victims throughout the country. I mean, I think that's been very fascinating um, as well. So there, there's- uh, Yes, Nina, yeah. I, I have to say that we, we will try to, to specify uh, the, the sort of, uh, I mean, the, the sort of listening, the sort of testimonies, especially we need now, you, you see? Because we, we have already a lot of questions to solve and we need more information. For instance, I, I personally, I want to keep my discussion with the army. Uh, and also with business people and, and also in the deep Colombian countryside with the communities and especially indigenous people. And we need time for that. That's wonderful. Um, one question that came is, uh, so the ICC is moving forward with investigating uh, the Venezuelan uh, regime for crimes against humanity. This was all over the news, I think around the world. <laughs> Um, in the past two weeks. 
why has the ICC decided not to do this for Colombia, which is a decision considered controversial by many. Um, and if they did, would an investigation of this type put the Colombian peace process at an advantage or a disadvantage? Do you have any opinion about this, yes. this question? Yes. Yeah. We, we had discussed the problem or the, the, the issue with the special jurisdiction for peace. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, the, the point is quite complex. It's, it's quite complex, you know, because when, when, when the court, the international court decided to do that, they are stressing the importance of the special jurisdiction for peace. Mm -hmm. They are conditioning the government, our state. They are telling the government, we insist, we demand the international, the special jurisdiction for peace to be protected. And you have to be very serious with this special jurisdiction for peace. And this is the conditioning. And with the, the sentences of the special jurisdiction for peace, and we are going to take care of that. If you don't support the special jurisdiction for peace, the international court will come again on Colombia. And this is, in, in, I mean, it's controversial, but it's very important for the Colombian peace process now. Um, do you um, understand your work as the Truth Commission uh, and reconciliation more as a goal or a process? That's another question. And then related to that, we got another one that said, given everything that you've heard, and seen, um, how do you define um, truth and reconciliation in Colombia? Well, <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy question. Easy question. <laughs> easy question we are discussing every day <laughs> here in the Truth Commission in our meetings. Now, now obviously, reconciliation is a process, as uh, um, Alberto Ferguson was was uh, telling us. Mm. But, you know, in my opinion, there are three different aspects in this process of reconciliation. The first one is consistency, the possibility of, please don't kill people. This is coexistence. We are not going to kill each other by, by no reason, and especially by no political reasons. Stop using weapons in the political controversy. Okay, this is the first point of the, of the of reconciliation, coexistence. Mm -hmm. the, the, the second point is conviviality. I mean, uh, com convivencia, conviviality in, in the countryside, among the communities. I mean, uh, we respect you. Probably we cannot be friends, but we are going to build to work together in this country. And the third point finally is community. And basically, basically thinking in the future, the community we have to prepare for the children of Colombia. They were not during the conflict, but they are to be done. And some uh, together, the, 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 the possibility of a new different society. This is about reconciliation, eh? uh, obviously uh, uh, quite a, a big challenge, but there we are. Uh, and the second one, yes, I was trying to explain to you the five basic points yeah. we, we face when talking about truth. Uh, the, the personal challenge, the public challenge, the, the, the enormous hermeneutical and understanding confrontation we have there, the, the, the continuous contrast between different viewpoints in any aspects, uh, in, in, in any sort of, um, really, of issue we are discussing. Uh, and, and this is, this is quite a, a, a challenge. Uh, and after that, the ethical problem coming from there, I mean, we have to tell the truth, even if this is risky and dangerous. And, and you have to 
to face the, the decision of making real effective recommendation to stop the you, you know the crimes or the the, the tragedy rebelled by the truth. This is not this is not just an academic affair or an, an, an academic proposal, but this is an idea of transforming a country or of starting the transformation or helping the transformation of a country. So another question that um, came in uh, was about how does the Truth Commission interpret violence that has taken place after the 2016 peace accords? And what does it mean to promote reconciliation in the context of ongoing violence? This is a very sad reality. In, in our opinions, because of the absence of the state uh, in the places abandoned or left by the far when they came to the peace process, the building peace process in Colombia. Um, and also because of the absence of commitment of our president and the Colombian party ruling the country with the peace process already agreed in the, in the FARC. Uh, we, there, there was, it, it was very, a very important moment for the country. And we were meeting certainly an extraordinary leader, you know, able to summon all the people, I mean, the indigenous, the trade unions, the journalists, the universities, young people, also businessmen. I mean, I'm inviting them to, a big concession of the peace process, and we didn't have it. So um, because of that, uh, the fragility of the peace process was manifested. Uh, now, uh, but I have to say that the situation in Colombia now is, is quite different. We, we are not living the, the, the conflict we used to have with the FARC. We, we had the conflict with the FARC when the massacres every month or twice a month were 120 people or 80 people. And, and you had about 300 soldiers kidnapped by the FARC and, uh, the, every, and 60, 000, um 60,000 false positives and things like that. No, the situation is different, but, but the killing of the leaders and even the killings of the, the far people who left the art yesterday, another one was killed in the south of the country. And this is very, very sad and difficult. Um, so we're about wrapping up here, but there are two uh, final questions that refer really to other countries um, and, and how that interplays with the process that you're undergoing in Colombia. Uh, one is when you mentioned um, how do you define truth, um, one of the participants says that they recall the Informe de Esclarecimiento Histórico en Guatemala from 1998, and how even to this day, there are many sectors who disregard that report saying it was biased um, and that it didn't consider some aspects and, and, and so forth. This is a big challenge going forward and um, the participant imagines that it's gonna be even more difficult 20 years uh, from now because polarization seems to be on the rise. How can that be addressed in Colombia? And then um, related to comparisons with other countries, uh, another participant wrote that um, while there are very, a lot of specificities when it comes to the Colombian conflict, are there any lessons from other countries, historical truth and reconciliation uh, processes or post-conflict processes that have been particularly instructive to you and your colleagues' work? Um, and they also thank you for all of your tireless work. When I just start from the last questions, from the, from the last question, yes, we have learned a lot from what happened in South Africa, what happened in Peru, Guatemala, Guatemala, because one of our commissioners 
uh, participated in the Guatemala uh, Cruz Commission, especially the Church Cruz Commission of Guatemala, and also two of them participated in the Peru Cruz Commission, mm -hmm. um, also uh, in Ireland, and, uh, and some of the African commissions. And we have been very attentive to what happened to them and the lessons they got from the processes. And, um, and you are right, I mean, the person referring to the situation in Guatemala, probably because of that, the, the system of transition in Colombia is so complex. Uh, certainly trying to, to anticipate the sort of problem finally happened in Guatemala and in other countries. And it, it forcing us to work for reconciliation at the same time we are working for Tusk and giving us two months for visiting the country everywhere to discuss with the society what we have produced or what we have encountered, discovered, this, entering in conversation with every people. But we know, we know. The, the discussion and also the confrontation is going to be difficult and hard. And because of that, we expect the support of Wola and the support <laughs> of the support <laughs> of the University and, and our friends <laughs> everywhere. I invite you, you know, this, is an inter, this is an international question. I mean, the problem in Colombia is a humanitarian problem that the, the solution in Colombia is it's not for Colombia. It's, it's, it's for a, for a world. They need it. They need it everywhere in the world. That's the point. Well, um, you can certainly count with our support as much as we can give it. Um, and uh, really, thank you so much, Father Daru, for all of your reflections and you know taking this time out of your incredibly busy um, schedule to you know reflect at this point in time and. Hopefully this will be part of several reflections moving forward um, as you go into uh, developing that report and, and, and all of the different challenging work that you are doing. Um, again, I want to thank Georgetown University for putting this together um, and to again, honor the legacy of Dr. Mark Chernick who is very much missed um, and thank all of you for participating today and for all of you who've provided such thought provoking um, questions. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful thank day. Thank you, Jimena. Uh, thank you for the way you maintain the conversation among us. Thank you, Angelo, Alberto, Esteban, Esteban Morales. Uh, uh, really, it was a pleasure and how we are going to keep working together in this peace, complex Colombian process. <laughs> Certainly. Mm -hmm. Have a great day, everybody. That's a Friday. Mm -hmm.